And today we will have Dr. Cynthia Rush from the Department of Statistics at Columbia University. And her research interests lie broadly in the areas of statistical machine learning, high dimensional inference, information theory, and also applied probability. And today she will tell us something about the variational inference and robustness. Okay, so please just welcome our speaker. And please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for the, the invite. It feels uh, awesome to give uh, in-person talks again. Um, okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some recent work on variational inference and uh, robustness. So my plan um, is to, to start is to uh, okay. um, give kind of an, an intro to variational inference, but before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about some motivational, some motivation for variational inference at like a high level, right? Um, so kind of the motivating idea is, is the following, you know, um, when we think about the data sets that statisticians are working with these days, they look a lot different from, you know, the kinds of data sets that folks were studying 30 or 40 years ago. So in particular, you know, data sets have gotten much more complicated, right? So there are a number of ways that data can be complicated. So uh, probably the most obvious is just that we are often dealing with lots of data now, right? So if you think about the astronomers, um, you know, they're often collecting terabyte, terabytes of data every few seconds from their telescopes and they're doing this, you know, all night long, every night. Right? Um, otherwise, uh, data sets can have many dimensions. So for each data point, we might, you know, collect data on many variables. Um, another way that data could be um, complicated is that it's unstructured. So here I'm thinking about something like um, text data. So we might have, you know, data that's associated with all of the New York Times articles written in the, the last few years, right? And so this is unstructured in the sense that it doesn't kind of naturally fit into this sort of row column format that we usually put data in, right? You can kind of force the text data there, but the natural form is sort of, you know, an article of, uh, you know, varying numbers of words. And then finally, you know, we often deal with multimodal or interconnected data. So I'm thinking of things like, you know, data that comes from Facebook, right? So here we have a bunch of individuals. They're connected to each other in, in different ways. This could be represented by a, a graph. And the data is multimodal in the sense that, you know, uh, how these individuals communicate takes many different forms. So I might post something to everyone I'm friends with on on you know, social media, or perhaps I just send a message to one or two of my friends. So there's multiple ways that, that we collect um, the data. And in these, you know, sorts of problems, there's obviously lots of questions we'd like to answer. Um, so here I've just uh, included a, a few images of um, the types of complicated data that variational inference has been used to analyze. So in the image on the top left, uh, this is the output of a, a topic model for, um, something like 2 million New York Times uh, articles. So the idea here is that the input are, is, you know, these 2 million articles, and then the output is going to be a collection of topics where um, in the image we've shown the keywords from the top uh, 10 topics. So, you know, the, the one in the top left corner, the keywords are things like music, band, songs, rock. So this is you know, articles somehow about um, musical performances, but you know, in the bottom middle, you see things like stock market percent funds. So uh, this is about, you know, finance and, and so on. Uh, the bottom left image is uh, an archive uh, citation network that's based on about 600,000 uh, articles on the, the archive. So there the input would be kind of this graph where each node is an article and then uh, nodes are connected if uh, one of the articles cites the other, but you know, the input's uncolored, right? You get the uncolored graph and then the output is going to be a, a coloring of the nodes of the articles that sort of clusters them in some meaningful way. The image on the right, you know, is um, another uh, uh, data set that VI was used on. So this is uh, the made and missed shots of two NBA players in the top row, uh, Steph Curry and DeMarcus Cousins. And then um, in the middle rows, uh, it's giving, um, you know, sort of the, the probability from each of the locations that these folks will make shots. And then the bottom two rows are the, the sort of variance in those, those probabilities, right? So these are some of the kinds of data sets that, that VI can be used to, to analyze. 
Okay, so now the, the question is, um, you know, once we have these, this complicated data, how do we actually learn from it? Right? So often um, in machine learning, you know, the, the thing that machine learners are, are most interested in tends to be prediction. So if you think about something like, you know, the MNIST digits, if you use the MNIST digits to build an algorithm that'll sort letters based on zip code, this is somehow fundamentally a prediction task, right? But as statisticians, you know, we're often also interested in, in sort of inferring some structure from the data. So inferring some patterns that actually exist in the, the data set. Um, and one way uh, that, that we can, you know, infer such patterns is to take sort of a, a, an applied Bayesian statistics approach, right? Where we can build a model that, um, you know, uh, considers both sort of domain knowledge or the, the sort of assumed theoretical understandings of the data in a way that, that kind of acknowledges our assumptions on the data, but also lets the data speak for itself so that, that we can learn from it. And so um, what we're going to focus on, on today is, is sort of this question of how do we actually, you know, infer patterns from the data through this, this modeling technique. So the idea is, you know, we, we build a model right, that uh, encodes, you know, our, our understanding of the world, right? um, but also allows the data to give us some information. And formally, this model is going to be a, a probabilistic model over both observable and latent or hidden variables. And so um, then the, the, the sort of question becomes, you know, with our model and with our data, can we learn from the data by sort of squaring this model with the, the, the observable? Right? And more formally or more mathematically, the, this sort of uh, model is going to be a joint probability distribution um, over these, uh, uh, I'm trying to see if, can you see the cursor? I had some animations that got lost, so maybe I'll just try to emphasize what I'm talking about with the, the cursor there. Okay, so mathematically, right, the, the model is going to be a joint distribution over these observable and latent variables. And generally, what, the way that we, we learn from the data is to study kind of the, the uh, distribution of these hidden variables, the, the variables we can observe given the data, or we study the, the posterior. Right, and so generally, this is this is referred to as posterior inference in the the sort of Bayesian framework. All right, so now um, we're going to think about this sort of posterior inference, where you know we we have a model and we have a, some data, and we'd like to learn something about the hidden variables in the model. And so the aim is going to be able to 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 be able to characterize this posterior distribution. So this is the distribution of these hidden variables given the, the observations um, in ways that are both general and scalable. So we want, uh, the, we want to be able to access this posterior distribution um, with algorithms that work for many different models, right? We have all different kinds of data that we'd, we'd like to, to learn on. Um, and we also want them to scale well, right? So when there's lots of data, uh, they can still work uh, in a way that's computationally efficient. And so um, this posterior inference, this actually accessing that posterior distribution is what we're going to focus on today. OK, so um, now I want to give a, a quick sort of uh, introduction to variational inference. OK, so what we talked about before right, is doing posterior inference, right? finding this posterior distribution of the hidden variables given the data. So we said that this is based on our, our model, which is um, a joint distribution on observables that we'll call X. So these are like our data points and latent variables that uh, we can't observe, right? And so we're thinking of the latent variables as a vector theta. And so um, what we'd like to access is uh, the posterior distribution over here uh, of the latent variables given the data, which of course is just the ratio of the joint distribution to the, the marginal. So in theory, right, this, this posterior distribution is, is something that's easy to access, but in practice, it, it often, that's not the, the case. Um, this is because in, in many applications, computing this marginal distribution, um, this P of X is, is difficult. 
either it can't be found in closed form um, or and or um, in order to approximate it, it takes you know exponential time and the the size of the data. So um, in many applications, since we we can't side you know approximate this or since we can't um, actually access this posterior distribution directly, um, what we do is we appeal to a sort of approximate posterior inference, right? So we say, okay, there's no hope of actually getting this distribution and working with that. So perhaps we can, you know, estimate it in a way that, that that's reasonable and also uh, computationally efficient. So uh, variational inference is one form of this sort of approximate posterior inference. So the idea with variational inference, or, or what I'll call VI, is um, that we're going to turn this inference problem, you know, actually accessing that posterior distribution, we're going to turn that into an optimization task. Okay? Uh, why? Because, I don't know, we're pretty good at optimization and we, we can do it quickly in, in a lot of cases. Right? So um, variational inference works in, in two steps. So uh, the first step is, is the following. We're going to posit a variational family. And so this is going to be a family of distributions over the latent variables. And um, we're going to label them as, as Q, and they're parameterized by some vector nu. Right? And so then um, what we're going to do is try to find the distribution in that family that's closest to our true posterior, the thing we'd really like to have. And um, the way that we do that is we're going to, to find um, a variational uh, factor nu, a variational parameter nu, such that uh, the, the um, approximating distribution in our variational family is closest in KL divergence to um, this true posterior. So uh, let's kind of zoom in on, on this picture uh, that I stole from um, Dave Bly, Rajesh Raghunath, and, and Shakir Mohammed's um, NeurIPS tutorial in 2016. So this is kind of an illustration of what variational inference is doing. So what I'm thinking about is, you know, in the, the, the sort of the entire space of the image, these are all the possible distributions over my latent variables, right? So in particular, kind of in the, the top part right here, we have our, our true posterior. Right, it, it's up there. We're thinking of the data as being fixed, so that's just some uh, distribution over our latent variables um, sitting in the the space of all distributions. Then the oval in the image is going to represent uh, the distributions that belong to my variational family. Right, so this is uh, you know what we called on the last slide uh, the all the the possible distributions that are parameterized by by this vector nu. And so what I'd like to find is the new star over here that's uh, the, the value within my variational family that's the closest to my true approximating distribution in terms of the, the KL divergence, right? And so the normal way we do this, the squiggly line there is just to say that, you know, usually when we're doing VI, we start with some initial guess and then we run some algorithm that, you know, uh, gets us closer and closer to the, the, the new star that, that we'd like. Okay, so um, I'll pause for a second, but just to, to point out that the VI isn't uh, the only way to do uh, this sort of approximate posterior inference. And um, in fact, you, you probably know um, some other good ways, for example, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So um, kind of the idea with MCMC, right, is whereas VI wants to turn inference into optimization, MCMC wants to turn inference into sampling, right? So when we, we run MCMC, the idea is, is the following. So we're going to construct an ergodic Markov chain on um, my latent variables. And uh, we're going to construct this chain such that the posterior distribution that I'd like to access is actually the stationary distribution of the chain, right? So then the idea is we can run the chain for a while and, you know, uh, assuming that it's properly mixed, we can start sampling from the chain, and we believe those samples are approximately drawn from uh, our, our posterior distribution because by construction, that's the stationary distribution of the chain, right? So with those samples, we can get an empirical estimate of uh, the posterior that we'd like. So um, compared to MCMC, uh, variational inference 
tends to be faster and a little bit easier to scale to large data sets. Um, but it's been studied less rigorously. And uh, for this reason, you know, its statistical properties aren't as well understood as uh, they are for MCMC. So, um, you know, there are some problems for which MCMC doesn't work well, particular if your data set's really big or your model is really complex. And so in those situations, VI is a, a possible um, good alternative. Okay, so here we can, I'm, I'm just gonna show a kind of a running example of, of VI through um, just a simple Gaussian mixture model. So this is a toy example, but I think it illustrates kind of, you know, the, the core ideas of the, the variational inference very well. So I'm just gonna think about our, our standard Gaussian mixture model. So we're going to have K components, capital K components. Um, and with each of those components, uh, we associate a mean mu. And um, we assume that, you know, uh, with each of those components, there's a normal distribution associated with that, that component. Um, where, you know, the mean is given by mu and the, the variance is going to be some, for the time being, known uh, hyperparameter. So then we draw the data according to a two-step process, right? So in the first step, uh, for each, you know, of our n data points, we take, you know, we want to sample the ith data point, right? What do we do? In the first step, we randomly chose one of the k components, all with equal probability. And then once we've chosen the, the component that, that um, our data point belongs to, uh, we, we, you know, then sample that data point from the corresponding normal, right? So, um, okay, so this is a problem where we have uh, lots of hidden variables, right? So when we see our data set X1 through uh, Xn, it's going to look like this down here, right? So we can think of the, the hidden components as being the means of the components, so that k-length vector of means but also the assignments of the data points themselves. So there's also a, a, you know, hidden variables that are C1 through CN, where I'm, I'm thinking of CI as encoding the, the component that uh, my ith data point is drawn from. Right. Okay, so um, let's think about, you know, doing posterior inference here, right? So what I wanna do is I have my data set and now I'd like to, study the conditional uh, probability of my hidden variables given that data, right? So we can write out the joint distribution of the data and the latent variables, right? So here are my latent variables. Again, my hidden variables are C and mu. Um, and so my joint is over the data in C and mu. I can factor that as, you know, a conditional times the marginals, uh, the marginals uh, factor. And then we can factor over the, the i's as well because our, our data is drawn iid from this, this distribution. So of course, right, what we'd like to calculate is this posterior, that's the ratio of uh, the joint to the marginal. But we, have the, we, we very quickly get to the problem that we, we sort of uh, mentioned before, right? When we think about trying to compute this marginal of just the data, it gets complicated because, um, you know, what happens? Well, now when we're integrating over this mu, right, that mu is a vector of length k that's not going to factor in this, this joint uh, density. And so when we try to calculate this um, marginal distribution, we now have a k-dimensional integral. And even if we try to approximate that, you know, it, it's sort of complexity is like k to the n, right? So um, this is a, you know, even though this is kind of a toy example, right, we can see why the, the actually doing the posterior inference directly becomes um, tricky. Okay, so now let's go back to, to um, what we said VI is gonna do uh, in order to help us. How do we actually approximate, um, you know, this, this density? So uh, we said that, that VI proceeds in, in two steps. Right, so first we have to choose a, a variational family. And then in the second step, we find the parameter uh, from that parametric variational family that gives us the, the distribution that's closest in KL um, to my true posterior. So um, mathematically, right, this is kind of written up on the, the top right side here, right? So our goal is to find our optimal 
uh, density and, you know, my variational family. So I'd like to find the, the new star where uh, new star is, you know, the, the new that, that minimizes this KL divergence, right? Where um, we recall that the KL divergence between two densities, right, is, is right here on the slide. It's kind of a, the expected value of log Q over P, where the expectation is, is taken with respect to, to Q. Okay. So kind of the, the takeaway here, right, is that when we think about the complexity um, of this optimization, it's going to depend on the richness of my variational family, right? So, uh, you know, in an extreme case, right, my variational family could just be all dis distributions, but somehow then we're, we're kind of um, back to the, the, the start. So, um, you know, when we think about deciding a variational family, you want to, to find something that's rich enough to give you a good approximation to the truth, but also sort of simple enough so that, that this, this uh, optimization program can actually run. Right? And so um, kind of what you should be thinking about now is, is, is sort of, you know, how do we actually do this optimization, right, if we can't actually access this posterior in the first place, right? So how do we, how do, we do this, right? If, if I told you I don't know um, what my conditional distribution is. And so in some sense, I think this is kind of like the lucky part of uh, variational inference. So um, the, the point is the following, right? So we first notice that if we expand this, this KL divergence, so I've just dropped the new parameters, save myself some space, but you know, this, this, this is my variational density, right? Um, then we get that this KL is equal to three terms in this bottom row, right? So one's the expected value of uh, the log uh, variational uh, density. Um, one's the expected value of the, the log joint. And then the other one is the log marginal, right? And this is the thing that's hard to complicate or hard to calculate, right? Um, but like kind of the, the cool thing, right, is, is we're trying to optimize this with respect to, to new, right, with respect to the, the Q densities. So this last term, the one that we can't, you know, actually do much with doesn't matter to the optimization, right? So um, the idea is, you know, what we optimize instead is the elbow, which is just going to be this KL, distrib uh, uh, this KL measure, but with this last term uh, dropped, right? And so kind of the, where we're at, right, is that now if we maximize um, the elbow, this is going to be equivalent to uh, minimizing this KL divergence, right? So I've just flipped the signs to get the minimum and the max, right? Um, because, you know, this term that, that, that's hard to, hard to calculate, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to the, the optimization. Okay. So, um, Okay, now that we've convinced ourselves that, you know, we, we have like sort of a, a, a reasonable optimization task before us, um, the last thing that we, we need to, to sort of consider is how do we actually choose this variational family? So what is the, the set of cues that um, we're going to look at in order that we can do all these things that, you know, um, I'm trying to convince you we can do? Um, okay, and, you know, as we said before, the, the uh, the sort of concern when we're talking about this variational family is that we want, um, you know, something that balances two extremes. If the family is too complex, the optimization becomes difficult. But if the family is too restrictive, then whatever we find isn't actually going to be a good approximation to the posterior that we're interested in. So we're trying to balance between those two extremes. Um, by far the most common choice of variational family uh, is the mean field family. Um, and this is the family of densities where, you know, the latent variables are assumed to be mutually independent and each gets their own variational factor. So, you know, in, in the slide, right, the mean field variational family are, are those such um, densities that this, this joint over, you know, all of the latent variables um, factorizes, and each uh, of the J latent variables gets their own parameter nu J. Okay. 
And so um, here I haven't really specified the form of the densities, the QJ, because that's going to depend on, you know, the, the type of hidden variable you're looking at, right? So if your hidden variable is continuous, perhaps you would choose the QJs to be Gaussian. But if your, uh, can, you know, if your, your hidden variable is perhaps a cluster assignment and a Gaussian mixture model, then you'll choose, you know, a, a different form there. So um, for the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to study the, the Gaussian mean field variational family. So this is a really limited family, right? So I'm assuming mutual independence of my hidden variables. And um, I'm going to assume that all of the, the, the densities um, in my variational family are, in fact, Gaussian densities. And, um, you know, this is kind of what we, we need to, to sort of do the theoretical analysis that I'll present um, in a, a minute, but you know, obviously, this is this is um, something that we'd like to to. This is an assumption we'd like to back off from in the future. Um, and in particular, you know, kind of ex getting theoretical results for more general classes of uh, variational families is really an active uh, area of research. So, um, just a, a plug uh, for. You know, so there's a lot of good work to be done and and sort of theory for VI, I think. Okay, so um, all right. So since we're going to talk about uh, the the mean field variational family uh, for the rest of my talk, um, let's just look at it in a little bit more detail. So this is just kind of a, a again a, a toy example, but the idea of the the mean field variational family is that it's rich in the sense that it can capture any marginal density of the latent variables, right? No matter what the marginals are, the, the, you know, it's, it's possible to capture it with the mean field family um, if you don't make the Gaussian assumption, right? Uh, but what it can't capture is the correlation between the hidden variables. And so this is illustrated in, in this image. So, you know, um, here I'm thinking my exact posterior uh, is a Gaussian and its contour is given by that violet uh, oval and the, the plot. So because the oval, you know, is, is sort of elongated, right? We know that, that um, the true posterior is a highly correlated two-dimensional Gaussian, okay? um, But in this case, the, the optimal mean field approximation is given by uh, a Gaussian whose contour is illustrated by the, the green circle uh, or the, the green oval there, there on the plot, right? And so, you know, what is the, the, this mean field approximation, right? It's Gaussian, but now by design, it's going to be the, the product of two Gaussians that are, are, are independent, right? So in this case, what we see is, you know, the mean is the same. So our, our mean field approximation gets the mean correct, um, but the, the variances are wrong, right? And this is because by design, we've sort of decoupled uh, the, those variances. And in particular, what we can see is that, um, you know, the marginal variances of my mean field approxima approximation underestimate the variance of the, the true posterior, right? And so this is kind of a common feature of VI is that we often underestimate the, the variance of the, the, the posterior. Uh, and it's an idea I'll, I'll come back to a little a little bit later. All right, so just to, to wrap up this this example of the Gaussian mixture, let's um, think about how we would you know what what are the mean field uh, variational families we'd use here, right? So if you remember our, our problem setup, we have latent variables um, C that are our cluster assignments and mu that are our means. Um, and so uh, if we think about using the mean field variational family, right, it's going to be densities of the following form where we've factored over, you know, uh, the, the N values of my hidden uh, Cs and the, the capital K values of my hidden mu's. So here, um, what I'm going to, to, you know, so what have we done, right? So each of these latent variables, the N Cs and the capital K mu's, each gets their own density. Um, and their own variational factors. And so I've, cho I've chosen the form of these densities to uh, represent the, you know, the, to, to be good models for the, the, the hidden variables themselves. So for example, the, the means, right, are continuous values. So um, we're choosing those variational um, 
densities to be Gaussian. And so they're parameterized by uh, every, every mean mu gets its own mean and its own variance. And then um, the CIs, right, that's a value between, uh, 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 and it's a, a number between one and K, right? Because it represents the, the, the cluster. So um, when we think about, you know, putting a, a probability density on that, um, it's gonna be a discrete distribution where, you know, uh, the probabilities of each of the values one through K is indexed by uh, this, this vector phi. Right? Okay. So, um, you know, with this, this, uh, sort of mean field variational family, we can now actually try to do the variational inference on this example, right? So what we're going to do is now try to optimize that elbow equation with respect to our variational factors. So here we have capital uh, KMs, capital KSs that are the, the variances, and um, then uh, N vectors phi. Right, so the optimization is actually over all of those variational factors. All right, so here's an example of how the variational inference actually works in this case. So uh, now I have some, some simulated data from R2, right, um, where uh, the data belongs to K equals five Gaussian clusters. And we've chosen the means um, and the, the covariances of those Gaussian clusters uh, randomly. So um, in the image, right, uh, you can kind of see it's, it's a little bit hidden behind the, the circles, but our data is down there in the, the colored clusters, right? But if you have this data set, you know, you don't see the colors, you just see the, the data points, right? Um, and so uh, the idea, right, is that we want to, to use VI to estimate, you know, give us those, those assignments, so give us the coloring, and also then estimate the, the means um, and perhaps the, the variances as well. So uh, the way that, that we do this is we use um, a coordinate ascent variational inference algorithm or a CAVI algorithm. And the way that this works, the CAVI algorithm iteratively updates estimates of each of my variational parameters. So the C's, the mu's, and the S's, um, one by one while holding the others constant. And what we can show is that, you know, with the sort of CAVI algorithm, what it does is it's going to climb the elbow um, sort of monotonically until it uh, reaches uh, a local uh, optimum. Right? And so um, this is uh, illustrated in this, this picture on the, the right. So, you know, the initialization of the CAVI algorithm is just we put a bunch of Gaussians at, uh, at the, the origin. And then, you know, as the algorithm iterates, it starts kind of finding its own clusters. So here it looks like it has two long clusters up here and some circles down here. So this is a little bit different in that I've allowed, I haven't assumed a known variance, but I have assumed known capital K. Okay. And so um, the algorithm iterates until, you know, if we look down here at about iteration 50, it's more or less found the, the five clusters, right? And so um, then what, what's plotted over here is just, you know, the, the value of the uh, elbow as the algorithm runs. So we can see that, you know, as we iterate, we climb the elbow until it sort of flattens off into uh, what is at least a, a local minimum. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, just to wrap up, you know, what I'm going to say about introducing VI, uh, I wanted to just give a little bit of a, a history. So, you know, I think um, work in, in VI and the ML community kind of started in the 90s. So Michael Jordan and his lab started working on uh, VI around that time. And um, at the same time, you know, uh, Neil and Hinton and uh, Hinton and Van Camp were also kind of looking at ideas around the EM algorithm and variational inference and neural nets. And so this is kind of when the, the VI things uh, started taking off. Um, but, you know, you could probably argue that some of the VI ideas go back even further to the statistical physics community, um, back even in like the 80s or, or so. Um, and in the meantime, you know, since the 90s, there's been a lot of really awesome work 
um, done in the, the area that, that makes, you know, VI very scalable, um, very fast, easy to derive, um, and, and so on. Um, but that being said, right, there's still a lot of work that, that needs to be done. Um, in particular, you know, uh, things like uh, how do we develop more generic approaches that can handle, you know, a wider class of, of models or, you know, as we mentioned, expanding the kind of variational families um, that we use in practice uh, and that we can understand theoretically. Um, in particular, you know, there's not much of a statistical theory around variational inference. Um, and so uh, for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to try to address this question and see what we can say, you know, kind of rigorously about uh, robustness and, and variational inference. Um, okay, just a quick pause uh, to say that um, there are a lot of nice references on variational inference. Um, in particular, I really like uh, this, this paper by Bly, uh, Kuku Kelber, McAuliffe on, uh, you know, a, a review for statisticians on variational inference. And in fact, a lot of, you know, what I, that the Gaussian uh, mixture model example I, I took from, from their paper. Um, okay. So uh, now I wanted to quickly just introduce the notion of robustness, and then we'll get to some of the, the theoretical um, results that, that I have. When am I supposed to be done? Sorry. OK. All right. So OK. So um, in our context, uh, the notion of robust statistics uh, is that you know we aim to make uh, or to provide inferential procedures that perform well even when the assumed model is wrong. So in other words, we want to look for procedures that are robust to model misspecification. And um, one way, one well, what we will study uh, in this um, line is a, a notion called an alpha posterior, uh, where the alpha posterior is um, proportional to uh, the prior on the, the hidden variables and um, the likelihood of the, the model, but the likelihood is raised to this value alpha, which is some number between zero and one. And so um, this is also called a tempered posterior or a fractional posterior or a power posterior um, in the literature. And so um, alpha posteriors, you know, uh, this is something that's been studied uh, at least back to like, I don't know, uh, early 2000s or something. Um, but it kind of has ha found some recent attention because in the kind of early to mid 2010s, I, I think, um, you know, some folks started to see some empirical robustness properties of these, these alpha posteriors. And so um, what we wanted to do today is, is try to characterize these robustness properties rigorously, if we can. And, in particular, we're going to study the alpha posteriors themselves to see if we can say something about their robustness properties um, and also their variational approximations, right? So if we do the variational inference, um, not to, you know, my, my usual posterior, but instead to my alpha posterior. And so the question is, does this variational uh, approximation also have uh, robustness properties? So here, um, again, I'm going to consider the Gaussian mean field families. So I denote this with this, this cursive uh, Q. And, you know, whenever I have a, a, a variational approximation, it's going to be a Q density. And now I'm going to, you know, instead of I'm going to throw away the new uh, notation and use a mu and sigma because it's, it's Gaussian, right? But in particular, the, signal, the sigma is a diagonal matrix, right? Because we're in the mean field family. OK. So, um, right, so, you know, the idea to enhance Bayesian procedures by, you know, decreasing the influence of the likelihood has gone back to at least the work of, of uh, Vopk and uh, Barron and Cover back in the, the 90s. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, has, has seen a lot of recent work um, in the, the last uh, decade or so. So in particular, a lot of this recent work um, which is even done by some of the folks in the audience right now, um, studies statistical properties of the alpha posteriors and even their variational approximations, um, often in, in high dimensional or non-parametric settings. So 
what we're going to do today is we were hoping to contribute to this this sort of recent line of work studying uh, properties of, of these posteriors. Um, but we're going to focus on kind of the classical setting of, of parametric low dimensional models, right? So we're not going to do the high dimensional thing yet, but just, you know, if we look at these, these sort of classic um, uh, asymptotics, can, can we say something rigorously about the robustness properties of, of these, um, these, these posteriors? Okay, so um, to do this, uh, I'm gonna assume a statistical model for our reserved data that's a parametric, um, family of densities where the parameter, you know, is, is uh, theta. And so then we say that uh, the true, uh, if P naught is the true density for X, so this is the true uh, data generating mechanism, um, then the statistical model, my, my cursive P there, is going to be misspecified if P naught does not belong to P, right? Um, so in this case, uh, or with this model, um, uh, uh, a value that we'll use a lot is the maximum likelihood estimator, which I uh, denote as theta hat ml of, uh, of p. It's just going to be the, the theta in my parameter space that maximizes uh, my likelihood. And so throughout, um, we're going to assume uniqueness and asymptotic normality of this maximum likelihood estimator. Um, the reason being this assumption is rather mild and we want to emphasize that, you know, kind of the theoretical results we give don't rely on sort of non-standard asymptotic distributions. So uh, in this case, right, uh, for a correctly specified model, um, we have a, a true parameter theta star that's in my parameter space. So, you know, if P, if P naught is in cursive P, then theta star is in uh, capital theta, uh, parameter space. But for a misspecified model, right, P naught is not in P. Um, what we're going to call as the, the truth is this theta star that's going to be the theta star in my parameter space that's the best approximation in KL divergence to uh, the truth, right? So it's going to be a pseudo true parameter, All right? But in, in either case, the theta star is somehow the, the, the truth, even if it's, you know, just our best approximation. All right, so now let's let's um, wrap up with with some of the the new results. Um, so this is joint work with three of my colleagues, uh, Marco Avela, who's um, a statistician at Columbia with me, and uh, Pepe Montiel, who's an uh, econometrician at Columbia, and then uh, Emma Carr uh, Velez, who's a student at, at Northwestern. Okay, so our big idea for studying the robustness properties of uh, alpha posteriors and their variational approximation is the following. So we're gonna suppose if we have two different procedures that both lead to incorrect posterior inference, one procedure is more robust than the other um, if it is closer to the true posterior in KL divergence, right? So we have two procedures, they both are wrong at the end, but we're still gonna say one's better than the other if the thing that it finds is closer in KL to the thing we'd like than the other. Um, to the best of our knowledge, this idea uh, goes back to Gustafsson, um, but uh, which I, I think that's the, the first time this came up. And so with this notion of robustness, now the question is, are alpha posteriors or their variational approximations more robust um, than just standard Bayesian inference, right? Alpha equals one. Okay, so um, the first thing we needed to do when trying to answer this problem is look at the asymptotic distributions of alpha posteriors and their variational approximation. And so these asymptotic distributions are generally referred to as uh, BVM type results, Bernstein von Mises. So uh, these results for the alpha posteriors and their VI approximations extend to existing uh, BVM results from the, the literature. Um, the existing results are for, you know, usual posteriors under misspecification and for variational approximations of usual posteriors under uh, misspecification. And so what these results show is that, you know, um, they show asymptotic normality in the sense that the total variation between the studied distribution and its uh, limiting Gaussian goes, goes to zero. And so, um, you know, what we needed to do is, is figure out what are the asymptotic distributions of alpha posteriors and their VI approximations. And so when we started this, it, it wasn't, you know, immediately obvious, I guess, like what downweighting the likelihood would actually do for the asymptotics, but it turns out that uh, asymptotically, uh, 
the alpha posteriors and uh, their approximations are also Gaussian. Right? And so in introducing these results, I'll start with the results for the alpha posteriors, and um, then I'll, I'll tell the results for the, the VI approximations. So um, I'm going to go quickly over the assumptions. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to go quickly over the assumptions because they're essentially the same as in Klein and van der Bart. Um, we need um, uh, some assumption on the likelihood ratio process associated with my, my model to make sure it, it looks normal asym asymptotically. Um, and that we also need that our alpha posterior concentrates around the pseudo true parameter at the same rate as, as sort of assumption one. And so, um, you know, since we generalized Klein and van der Bart, who studied asymptotics for the usual posterior uh, under misspecification, we just have the exact same assumptions uh, as, as they do. And so then what we find is, is the following. So if we have our, um, you know, our, our alpha posterior, uh, then it has a, a limiting Gaussian distribution, which is this normal here, and the TV between the two goes to zero. So I'm going to call this the limiting Gaussian distribution, which is like a little bit of uh, an abusive notation because you'll notice that it still depends on n. So uh, forgive me. Um, okay, but so the takeaway, what we should see here, right, is that, all right, when we look at this limiting Gaussian, the, the mean is the same, right? The, uh, down, the alpha downweighting doesn't change the mean. But what it does change is, is the variance here. So this variance matrix is um, the, it's the matrix from assumption one that essentially measures the curvature of the likelihood. But what we see is now that variance is upweighted by a one over alpha term, right? So um, at, at some high level, right, it's like this alpha downweighting of the likelihood means that we're acting as if we have less data than we normally do, right? So normally we have n data points, but now it's as if we have n times alpha data points where, you know, having fewer data points doesn't change your mean, but it, it you scales up the variance, right? And so this is kind of interesting because, you know, this corrects some of the underestimation of the, the variance. Um, or, well, sorry, well, I haven't gotten to the VI part yet. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Okay. Um, and then, okay, so now um, that we have the, the BVM for the alpha posteriors, we'd like to look at the BVM for their variational approximation. And so, you know, at a high level, right, if I know that my alpha posterior uh, converges to a multivariate Gaussian, then I would assume that my Gaussian mean field approximation to the alpha posterior converges to the Gaussian mean field approximation of that limiting Gaussian. And it turns out that this is what happens. Um, so um, just to, to, to speed things along, so uh, here I've just defined some, some more uh, notation specifically related to the Gaussian mean field approximation of the limiting Gaussian of the alpha posterior. So this is something we can find in closed form. And um, it's, the, it's the same mean, but it has a variance that's now diagonalized which is not surprising because it's a mean field uh, approximation. And so um, under some more, uh, a slightly different regularity condition, we, we get the, the result for the VI approximations of, of uh, alpha posteriors, which says that, you know, the, the VI uh, approximation of the alpha posterior has, uh, is asymptotically normal um, with the, the same mean, but now um, this diagonalized covariance, right? And again, um, the, the point I wanted to make earlier, but it should be made now, right, is that we're scaling up the variance, um, which in terms of variational inference, is, it's somehow uh, a good thing to do because variational inference uh, underestimates the variance um, uh, normally. So scaling up is, is, is not bad. Okay. so. Um, I'll skip the review um, of the, the notation so I can, I can get to my, my final result. Um, so now we actually want to do this misspecification robustness analysis, right? So what we said is, you know, we want to, we were going to use the ideas of Gustafsson, right, um, to, to analyze robustness. So what we'd like to measure is the closeness in kullback leibler divergence of the alpha posterior or its uh, approximation to the correct posterior. Right, and the idea is that you know if we find that that KL divergence is minimized with an alpha that's less than um, one, 
right? Then in this notion of robustness due to Gustafson, this says that the, the alpha tempering is, is good, right? Because this is minimizing the KL divergence between um, the, the posterior and the truth. Okay. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip some of the details um, here. And if it gets too confusing, I might go back. But I'll, I'll try to give a high level idea of, of what's going on. So, um, you know, what we want to do is, is measure these KL divergences between, you know, the alpha posterior and the truth. And that's hard to do directly because they're just general forms. So what we study instead are um, the KL divergences between the limiting Gaussians of uh, the, the two uh, distributions, right? So we have this BVM theory that says, you know, well, if N is big, the alpha posteriors kind of look like a, a Gaussian you know, so do their variational approximations. And so what we study is the KL divergences between actually those limits. And this is nice because, you know, the KL divergence between two normals, we can like completely characterize. And so um, just to, to, to give the kind of the takeaway um, is that what we find is that when we study these KL divergences, um, here we're, we're looking at alpha stars. So these are gonna be the alphas that minimize the KL divergences between uh, the alpha posterior and the truth. And then the alpha tilde is the one that minimizes the KL divergence between the variational approximation to the alpha posterior and the truth. And so what we see is that in both of these cases, this optimal alpha is less than one, right? So this says that, that you know, this tempering helps us. And if we look at, you know, uh, at these values a little bit more closely, we can kind of, it, it makes sense the way that, that it helps us. Um, so here's, this is one of the slides where things were going to pop up nicely and so you could, you know, see where to, to focus, but um, it's a little bit chaotic, chaotic now. But kind of the takeaway is, okay, so if this is the alpha star, you know, this, is, this tells us the amount of tempering that's optimal if we're just studying alpha posteriors, right? And so what it says is, um, you know, that if we look at, for example, the difference between, uh, you know, our, our sort of true theta and the, the pseudo true parameter, as this gets big, uh, the alpha star gets smaller, right? So as the model is, is more misspecified, then we need more tempering. And that somehow um, makes intuitive sense, right? And it's the same thing if we look at the, the alpha tilde, which is the one for the variational approximation, we see the same sort of form. So as the misspecification gets larger, we need more um, tempering. So uh, I will wrap up here. Um, there's some more interesting details uh, that I, I didn't get to, to share. Um, one is that, uh, for example, we can prove in some cases that actually variational inference gives us more robustness than the alpha posterior itself. So, you know, at first we just were asking, does VI retain the robustness of the alpha posterior? But in some situations, it actually is more robust, um, which was uh, something we were we were excited to find. Um, but I'll stop there. Yeah, so it's a little, I've, um, so I skipped kind of like some of the, the, the details here. So it's, it's like asymptotically, if you are completely sure you are misspecified, then, you know, what it kind of shows is that alpha star goes to zero, right? So if you're completely misspecified, then it's like, well, don't use the model. You know, um, if, you, if you know you're completely misspecified, don't use the model. Similarly, if you know you're 
if you know you're correct, then alpha star goes to, to one. And so it says, you know, it well, great, like you should. Um, yeah, so there's this complicated in-between area um, that, you know, we've chosen to analyze it in sort of a way where uh, we assume that there's uh, some like probability of misspecification uh, in the beginning that the researcher has. So we're imagining kind of a, a researcher who, you know, has worked really hard and like thinks their model is correct, but acknowledges that perhaps it, it's not. And so there's this kind of trade-off between, you know, um, a, prob a probability of, of being misspecified and a probability not. And so, in fact, we're working with kind of K expected KLs to analyze the robustness there. Um, so, I think the answer is like, yes, and it's a little bit, you know, it's the, I, the, I didn't get a chance to like give the details, but yeah, there's this kind of, um, there's this other layer of it that we're putting a probability density over the misspecification and correct specification that gives us this regime where interesting things are going on. I don't know if that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 